Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is David Palmer, the Leo King, and I'm here with Ann Warkey here from HighVibe.tv, and we are here to discuss a deeper dive into what is going on with Rising Through the Darkness Purgatory and all the history. If y'all don't know, you can get Rising Through the Darkness Purgatory on HighVibe.tv. It's a four and a half hour presentation that I did, and it's kind of interesting because after doing that presentation, having a history professor that's working for HighVibe.tv makes you even question things even more deeper. And when you have a history professor at your disposal, it makes life a lot more fun for somebody like me who loves history. And I know a lot of you all do out there. Um, last thing we did together, Anne, was our demonology uh, documentary. A year, over a year ago now, right? Wasn't that in, or was that a year ago? I, uh, well... I remember it was during the pandemic, and I remember that we were talking about King James, and the crows started coming mm -hmm. when we started getting really deep into stuff, and that's never happened here before. No crows have ever come on the top of the studios, and we're literally crowing. It was looking at us through the window, keeping an eye it on us. It was so it weird. Was, yeah. I wonder what's going to be weird tonight on tonight's show. Um, the audio needs to be louder. That's mm -hmm. one thing, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I, you know, I, it's interesting because if y'all don't know, um, here at High Vibe, I think history's talked about even more than tarot or astrology or anything like that. Is it? I would I say so, <laughs> or maybe it's just been in the last like couple months. Yeah, but it's, but it's always being talked about. I think it's all talked about together, right? It's all history's a part of astrology and tarot. I would say right. that, especially with astrology, I mean, it's the real way to know if you look at it from a scientific form. I mean, what do you have as the background to look at to know what the astrology is doing is you use historical events where the planets were at that time mm -hmm. to be able to see, well, this this in history happened. And is there a common denominator every time these aspects are happening in astrology that actually historically have significance and I've been seeing it you know spreading around more and more especially a lot of astrology channels all around they're actually starting to throw out more history right that's been like the core of how I've put astrology mm -hmm. out for over a decade but yeah I've noticed I think that it's too. good it's mm -hmm. good though yeah and for us you know I don't know what I don't know what kind of happened recently but I just started buying really old books Maybe it was because of my family history. I don't know. But also, Anne, is, why don't you tell people, I mean, because really as a professor uh, in English history especially, you know, what got you into that? Because I think that's important to, under really, to really understand, like, because all the work that we keep coming up with comes to that really, really weird time of where England itself and so much of the history and the records and, and, and so much, especially even with astrology or even if you look at your specific time period that you cover, uh, so much of what we're going through now is so much in what you study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it is in really surprising ways. I never expected this, right? But my history that I study um, or that's been the center of my research is called Early Modern Europe and Early Modern Britain in particular. And that means that I study that period of time that's between the medieval era and modern era, which really kind of starts around the time of the Industrial Revolution hmm. or maybe a little bit, you know, after the French Revolution. Um, so I focus on that period between when um, what was happening in the world was it was kind of shifting from a, me a medieval world where things were smaller and the church was more in mm -hmm. power and then kind of going from that period to the more modern area era that we consider to be more secular right. so the church is always a big part of that um, and in doing all of my research a lot of times I would come across astrological references a lot of references to alchemy in in books on early modern science or new or the natural philosophy right and all of those things I kind of just would sort of skip over like, okay, and then that's ast astrology or that's something else. And now let me get to the real history. Mm. But I've always been really curious about all the other stuff. 
because the people I studied, all of all of these things, astrology, alchemy, would have been things that they understood, that would have been part of their mental furniture, as some historians right. have called it. And, you know, the way they looked at the world was shaped by those ideas or mm-hmm. the ideas of the church, right? So, Or a blend of both sometimes, but that right. kind of got a little weird. Yeah, and it was a blend of both, more than we even think. Yeah. Know? So. I mean, we were talking about, I think it was Robert Flood, and he's, I think he was in the uh, 1600s. And, you know, he was, especially when you get to like the Rosicrucian movement, he was a Rosicrucian. There was that whole like divine godly element mm-hmm. and you, going through so much of the church, but also he was a, a physician. A lot of people back then, especially that did a lot of real powerful work. They were not only physicians, but they were alchemists. And then they were mixing this science element to things mm-hmm. and the church element and with all the esoteric things, of course, through alchemy, all in one. It was right. just like y- you were a well-rounded person in all of it and you were the top in your field in all a- areas. And those are the people that really are the work that's kind of left. There's not a lot that's really left, but there's stuff that is left that stands out dramatically. Mm-hmm. But then I think we're kind of discovering some stuff that's, been kind of hidden under the radar that almost is like maybe it just didn't get attention or Mm -hmm. I don't know like especially we have one book sitting here that's just you know it's about fighting against the uh Catholic Church and and defending the Reformation that Elizabeth the first did and as you and I have gone deeper into that it's just like wow like there's a treasure trove of information I know the book that we have sitting here is from 1675 Mm -hmm. but it was actually written back in 1657 but, you know, it's like that man went through the Civil War of England and, mm-hmm. and, and so much of monarchy changing. And, and it's kind of weird because I almost feel like we're at that weird period in time right now where you don't see the monarchy as much. Y- you have people right now in the world that are really kind of where is the world going to go? And that was a lot of what, mm-hmm. especially the periods that you teach uh, and, and do lectures on and, and teach your students that's really a lot of the time period that you're fascinated with. I remember one of the first things that you were showing me when I was asking about the history that you teach was about the civil war in England. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I really was not that well versed in it. And I still am not as versed as let's say American civil war, right? Like I can go all day on that, but I don't think a lot of people really realize that a King's head was chopped off. And there was, there was a time where people tried to rule themselves and then they, didn't feel like they could do it and then they brought the monarch back so right. it's kind of interesting to i don't know how do you feel about that with how the world is right now and today i think that um i've really felt so weird through this whole period of time because i feel more and more like the time that i study is increasingly more and more relevant and i know one of the things i've always thought as i was being a professor or when i was in graduate school i would always think I really just wish I could do something relevant. Like I'm so interested in all these things Mm. that are just so nerdy and they don't relate to anything. (laughs) And now I'm thinking, oh, they really relate. Like they really are relating. And what's really funny is the periods of time you just mentioned, like the English Civil War, I feel like there's so much overlap to to today and we could go on and on about that. And I wanted to do another show, another History in the Stars about that. Like I really, I mean, there's so much we could do. Then we've got on here on the table the um, book from 1675, and that's another era that's a real transitional period. And then the edition of Dante here is um, that's an 1888 edition, yep. right? Of an 1818 book or 1814. 18, 1814, right? but he started the work H.F. Uh, Carey, Reverend H.F. Carey, in 1805 and 1806, mm-hmm. and did that work until 1814, yeah. and then nobody would publish it because it was too controversial. Right, and it's, yeah, we can so, talk about more about why, but I was gonna just say like, those are th- are really transitional areas that I feel like we really are in that same kind of era now. Yeah, and then of course Dante's work traces back to, I mean, he was born in 1265, and uh, you know, during the last Saturn-Pluto-Jupiter conjunction we all just lived through in 2020, he was 19 years old. Um, mm-hmm going through his nodal return, which everybody does at 18 and 19, and created the work uh, of the Divine Comedies of of Inferno, uh, Purgatory, and 
Paradiso, and mm-hmm. it's purgatory that I've done in that whole lecture that I did that was connected to what I feel astrologically and also through the work of Dante is what we're living through now. And it was this book that, like, the, we, the lecture was done, right? It was like we had finished it here at High Vibe. Moved, we're moving on, and we've been redoing sets because, honestly, History in the Stars is a show that Ann and I want to do regularly, but it's been kind of one of those things where it's like, how are we going to do it more? Right. And I feel like it was like divine timed with all the events that have been going on and building this room and starting to build our own high vibe library of ancient books and kind of using books too to kind of go into areas. Right. It's almost like finding history is not something that you taught me this the best. <laughs> you teach your students not to just go into a library and just look for history. Like that's a, like looking for a needle in a haystack, right. but to have a point to go look for a point in history. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we're finding those those points now and astrology helps of course but i also feel like just looking at the world today more than ever i think that history is the most important thing that we can look at and history can be jaded Mm -hmm. in so many ways right but you know what you've taught me is sometimes you should just go looking for a book or sometimes you're looking for a book and you order it and you open it and there's a picture of of uh, is it Lancelot? <laughs> that yeah. Book or something well, that's that connects why, to something else. That's originally else. why I got that book. Was yeah. It popped up on one of the ancient rare bookstores online, and I was I just the, every week they update. I don't know how some of these places get these books. I just I don't want that's a secret. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, s- I they assume do. they go and actually have a plan and look for these things, right? Well, because I was doing the whole eBay thing, and then that brought me to where it was like I found a treasure trove Mm -hmm. place. So every week they put out new books, so I just start searching through them. And a lot of them, they do everything from, you know, American history to, but they have a whole esoteric um, occult section. Mm -hmm. And so that is the area that I keep looking in. And then I saw this Dante book and I'm like, wow, I just did all this Dante work. But there's so many Dante books out there, right? But it's usually just what Dante divine comedies are and they're just translated into whatever language. But this one was unique and it even said very rare because this one had a really big story of it, of a reverend in the 1800s who decided to basically interpret and use history because he has a chronological order of what happened during the life of Dante Mm -hmm. and connecting it to the divine comedies themselves and then creating his own, like, how would you call that? Like he, like the way that he did it in the book, he like created his own, like, I don't know, place and order of, of where in history it's connected to mm-hmm. either inferno purgatory or paradiso right. like and the exact lines and the, the place to look mm-hmm. well he did it he did his own translation from italian and in the process of doing it he actually calls the book i don't if you can look at the cover page i don't remember it's um you know it's the divine comedy right but he calls it dante's vision right or the vision um, which is something that tells you about how he's translating it and about his era, that he's going to take the idea of Dante and kind of apply it to um, to his, you know, England in 1804, I think is when he started to translate it. So he's taking it and adapting it to the English reader who really wasn't familiar with Dante. And something I realized while I was, you know, reading about Henry Francis, who did the um, the translation, is that he's doing a translation in an era when it was still becoming more legal and okay to be Catholic in Britain. Right. Right. Um, Catholic emancipation hadn't really happened yet. And. But Catholic people were being tolerated more and more. So I was just, re- I just realized how strange it would have been for people to even read a book or read a poem about purgatory. Because that's not an Anglican concept. No. It would have been considered to be, you know, too papish, too, too Catholic. Well, it was very interesting. Even while we were talking about doing this and the book arrived, the President of the United States just talked about, because he is Catholic. Mm-hmm. 
he he was in a speech saying, oh, it's like, in my faith, it's like those poor kids are here hanging watching the president. It's like being in purgatory. Right. And I told people in my presentation, like, you're going to see this vibe come mm -hmm. out. And then the president of the United States says it just in the last week. Right. Yeah. As we're preparing to do this video mm -hmm. for like the last couple of weeks. Right. So even though, you know, someone had pointed out, well, it's common. People say purgatory all the time. Like if you're Catholic or, you know, right. you might say purgatory a lot. But actually, it's not really common for a president to say that in a no. public speech or before a public speech. And for only the second Catholic president, right, of the United States to say some to use purgatory casually as if he's, you know, he's just referring to purgatory. Like right. these poor kids are having to be in purgatory. Well, that's, and he referred to his odd. own speech as being purgatory. for the kids as purgatory. <laughs> I know. <which> right. <laughs> I actually, if you watch the video uh, in the lecture, I go into that a little bit, mm -hmm. and actually a lot, actually a lot, and it it, it it kind of baffled me to be like taken back, like e excuse me, and I had to rewind the video, right? And I and it was a, it was like a disbel, like whoa, mm -hmm. and I think what you and I started revealing in this book, which I think this is more of an open conversation that we want to have with high vibers out there about starting to think about things, is this 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 time does feel like purgatory in between if we want to use i guess inferno hell and paradiso heaven like you can use it as darker light or mm -hmm. just kind of stuck in between not knowing where things are going and it's really interesting because in this book this chronological view of events of dante's life but the history of the world especially a lot of it was with what was going on more in, of course, Europe and England and right. around that area, but that it's all connected to the times in which he was alive. Mm -hmm. And now he's connecting it to these areas in the book. And I, it was like close to 60 to maybe 80% of it all was connected to purgatory, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And then both books that we have here, actually, it's kind of funny because it's like one book is so about the Church of England and defending uh, Elizabeth the first and, and the whole Reformation movement. Mm -hmm. And then Dante, you know, that wasn't even a thought for Dante back in the day. But then it's done by a reverend who actually is Church um, of England. a Church of England, you know, minister, reverend, reverend and minister yeah. and who's doing his own dissertation on this Catholic work. Mm -hmm. Which is even funnier because Dante at one point was kind of not in the history of Dante it was kind of like, like not taken seriously about this work, almost like the church didn't almost accept it yet. It's totally accepted now. Right. There's a lot of that. And I feel like if you look at the world today, there's a lot of that going on right now. Like the past presidents, uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter is now banned for two years. Hmm. Or, or is Facebook and, oh yeah, I think it's Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think that's what their choice was. And I think Twitter did too, right? Right. But it's kind of interesting. The more you look at all these old books, you see that common denominator. Yeah. And think about um, for Dante, when Dante was writing the Inferno or the Divine Comedy, he was in Florence in this era when the there were, I mean, there was just corruption in the church. Right. And... He had been allied with a party that supported the Pope and the church. But what happened was um, different kings in Europe were trying to get control of the Pope. Right. And so his party split and he ended up being kind of, <clears throat> I mean, kicked out of out of town. And he was having difficulties um, about that, about kind of finding his place in back in his community. But his, but the Pope was basically, from his perspective, the Pope would have been corrupt, right. and he was being um, controlled by the King of France, who then also cracked down and did pretty horrible things, like suppressing the Knights Templar Correct. very brutally. Which that's actually in this book, right? And, and and that was actually one of the things that we were talking about today earlier, which it shows it in here. Um, yeah, it goes into 1310 when the Knights Templar have been, yeah, the order the order of the Knights Templar abolished, and it connects it to Purgatory, mm -hmm. chapter 20, and verse, or I guess 
in the poem at the line of 94. Right. And it was interesting because it bring, bring, brought up the fleur de lis, although in English translation, it was flower. Right. Uh, I can't remember how, how yeah, you said yeah, it. Yeah, it was flower, do, do, flower of... Blossom? Blossom yeah, blossom. Flower, yeah, blossom something of flower, like something yeah. like that. And it was just really interesting to me because I don't want to sound crazy as an astrologer, but it's not like these exact events are going to happen, of course. Mm -hmm. But there's this really interesting energy from 1284 when Dante would have been 19. And when I looked at uh, this book and I started going into Dante's life of 1284, which was something in the presentation, of course, I didn't have too much. There was some info, but this 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 info gave me more than I can find anywhere on the internet or books about it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not really looked at that much. Um, let me find it real quick. Oh yeah, and it and it shows the f the following year. So twelve eighty four would be the year that we would have gone through in twenty twenty astrologically. Right. But in twelve eighty five, it was the Pope at the time, Martin the fourth, dies, and that's connected to purgatory. Philip the Third of France and Peter the Third of Aragon both pass away, and that's connected to purgatory. And then there's one more aspect in that time, and it's Henry the Second, King of Cyprus, comes to the throne connected to Paradiso. Hmm, mm -hmm. So, King of Cyprus. So back in the day. Where was Cy where was Cyprus? We know that Aragon would have been like what we know today is like Spain, correct? Mm -hmm. And that would have been. We need your map over here. I know <laughs> we do. got maps on the wall but, but over there. Cy where, were, where was Cyprus well, back in the beginning? Cyprus in, or the, still in the in the 1300s there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think it's down there by um, southern southern Italy, off the co or off the coast of Greece, or. You know, actually, I'm not, I don't even remember exactly where it is. And if it is the same location, then if they would be considering it a larger state, I don't know. I don't know my well, what, states what, what, from that area. What's really interesting to me is that if you use the, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, because there was one in 1284 then and in 1285, mm -hmm. but you know, if you use the one we're in now, um, that was JFK's pass away in the in the same spots, okay, right? Mm -hmm. And then what we've witnessed over the last, you know, last Jupiter Saturn was not a Pope passing away. So John Paul did pass away. It was John Paul the third or second that passed? I think it was which one in like nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. John Paul the second. Yeah, I it was think. John Paul the second. Mm -hmm. But then we saw Pope uh, Benedict, who was in power and then resigns, mm -hmm. which that had been like a, a long time. I think it was close to four or 500 years since anybody could have ever seen a Pope just like take down and step down. Popes die, you know, they, right. they, they got their control, they got yeah. their power. But like, we're in a place that's really weird because, you know, Pope Francis is now in. And when I was looking at this book, it was very interesting because it's like, okay, yeah, you know, but it's like, there's something about the events of today and there's there's a lot of questions about what's going on right now with the church of course the pope is also uh very different than you would think um with his very more liberal aspect of the church mm -hmm. and the transformation of it it's going through a transformation but also we're seeing um like events like right now in israel you know like prime minister netanyahu might be taken out of power mm -hmm. We're seeing um, questions about the power in America, whether people want to say it isn't or isn't happening. It's being talked about on the news every day. Right. So you can't deny and say that that's not a question. I'm not saying it's true or not true, but there's a part of it where if we're going to look back in history, they're going to be like uh, every day on the news from both sides. Mm -hmm. They're talking about it co constantly. And then you also have in England this element of like, okay, we know the queen's not going to be around much longer. What's going to happen there? And then there's even a lot of questions about the church, right? There's been uh, the archbishop that was in America who wrote the letter to Trump and like basically said that he doesn't trust the church about how the pandemic was handled and where the church is going with the pandemic. 
And that's like a pretty significant deal, writing a handwritten letter to the President of the United States and denouncing the Pope. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of these build-up stories that are actually very historically connected to some really powerful events that, ironically enough, it was through Dante's work. And it's all connected during that purgatory time, which we all kind of feel like these very in-between events. But it's almost like it's kind of weird. They show Henry II that shows up on power and they connect that with paradise, like some heavenly thing is if like we don't ever do that anymore do we we never I associate mean, politicians with paradise that's the problem <laughs> though maybe right well like, i mean yeah i mean we do <laughs> right i don't know we do there are such divergent ideas so so that view actually he is so we have to look at it between from two filters you've got henry francis who decided okay that's something i want to highlight in my the preface to the book Right. Is this particular idea about there can be a ruler who's connected to paradise, which to me is a little bit interesting because he's writing at the time when George the Third has gone mad already, right? So right. there's um, or they know he's going in and out of of madness and having to have a regent. So I wonder, and I haven't thought about that. I wonder if that's connected in his to his time in any way. But then also Dante himself is revealing something about his political beliefs in, in yes. that, right? So that he's he's taking a side. And he actually was um, condemned for what he wrote in here because it was very political and he had to kind of hide from some right. people after he wrote it because he offended people, right? Based on who was in each section of pur purgatory, right? Like I think yes. when you were talking about... Um, what were you referencing the the knights templar right that was in the section where he's working through avarice i think yes and it's about greed like because of greed and that's one the of the seven is, sins mm -hmm. of purgatory right yeah so there's so many ways you can make because your it, it was it was it was also uh I think it was not only greed, but, uh, you know, there was almost like a lustfulness, which is the top sin in purgatory mm -hmm. of like at that moment of like, well, the Knights Templar getting rid of them and then also taking everything that they had built. Like right. they had built quite a lot. I think a lot of people don't remember like mm -hmm. kind of the history of like it wasn't like they were just some guys that just had on their Red Cross. And oh, right. Like, yeah. Like they were they had formed their own they were wealthy, government. Very wealthy wealth. Too. Uh, they also had really got really spiritual too. kind of created mm -hmm. their own. They were going against the church in many ways with their spiritual beliefs. They were they were not really kind of at that right. point. And they weren't even formed in a way that was really about going to defend the the Holy Land. They, they were just like kind of asked by the Pope thousand years prior or a hundred years prior, kind of like, oh, like go over there and do this for us. And then it kind of just turned into it kind of evolved over time, mm -hmm. you know, and many Templars probably had no idea because like their fathers or great grandfathers or whatever just were like, we're, yeah, we're, we're in the Holy War now. Like, like what didn't start that way from my Knights Templar research? It was much more like, oh, we're, we're here. We're, we're doing the, our thing. We're helping things out. And like, the Pope's like, hey, will you guys do that? And of course, going through the kings mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, we have your men do that. Yeah. You know, I think they always kind of whether you use like Da Vinci code, right? Like they go into that whole story about it and they just mm -hmm. like how oh, how the King of France sends in his Knights Templars to take over the Holy Land, you know, and and, and and they just jump really fast in that movie to like the history just being this big moment and da da da, da and then move on. But there's so much history and there's right. so much evolving. And I feel that what purgatory though to me is is there is these weird sins, these seven sins. And there is this kind of weird element right now when I'm watching the governor of our state do lotteries, like he looks like a clown to me, like doing a lottery. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I had somebody that that's close to me go, how are they actually knowing who is going to win this lottery? Especially they're including people who already had received their their shot because you're not traced with it. So then this person called up to know. Right. And they were like, oh, well, the CDC <laughs> knows. Yeah. Well, then and they're they, like, they well, how record, do they know? Yeah. Because actually the truth is there is no tracking system with it. Hmm. So how much of it is really even true? 
that's the scary part. I just found out that information today from mm -hmm. very close, like who's actually doing the work to figure that out. Right. But I look at it like the sin of like this, there's a sloth, slothfulness, but there's also this like lust energy of like, get this and you're going to get a gun. You're going to get a beer. You're going to get, you're going to win fries. a million dollars. <laughs> French fries and, and a hamburger. You know, I mean, I covered a lot of that in way yeah. more detail and way more specific astrologically and so forth in purgatory, uh, rising through the darkness. But I feel like when I look at it now and I'm using now as we kind of are evolving and talking about this more kind of a, like more of a, I don't know, like a little bit removed from the work. And you helped me with that presentation because we went with just like the Dante's work and then I went with the astrology and it was like this magical thing that formed out. But mm -hmm. it's like now it's like, it's almost like the universe doesn't want it to end as far as like there's more information the universe keeps sending our way that is like adding just little tidbits, but they're important ones because I feel like it's like what I take out of all of it is don't be afraid to stand up for what you feel and what you want to say, like Dante did, or even uh, Roger Twisden, which is this book. And we'll show the cover pages and stuff of that because it's beautiful. And it kind of shows also the defending of mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and let's not talk about James or Charles I, but Charles II is in power. So that's published during that time. But, right. but Elizabeth I isn't red, you know? It's like one of those like, She's almost People, like Jesus in there. Yeah, <laughs> they're like back up their sides. Yeah. But it's like there is a weird element to things right now where this work I think is very important for people to hear because the more you read these two books, which so happen to be not even in common denominator of energy, right? But actually more common than you would ever actually think is two authors who literally like were denounced one of them put in the tower of london at one point and actually mm -hmm. had spent m multiple times in jail for for picking a side and for speaking truth yet it always gets published a little bit later so like the stuff we're seeing now about whatever you think is the wrong way or is banished there's more history and more stuff that stays and is published later once people don't feel scared to publish it right it reminds me of Copernicus, right? That he had mm. come up with his theory and um, it wasn't published while he was alive, but as soon as he died, his students made sure the, uh, that it got out there. And because Galileo didn't do that, he ended up getting persecuted, but right. he didn't get killed. So at least I guess that was good. <laughs> Just under well, house arrest. Yeah, I mean, but that, that's what's kind of fascinating to me is that I have another book that we got from 1712 and it's about defending basically people of magic because they were not really doing things that would go against the church of like what the idea of like demonology which actually we did a whole series on that a history of the stars mm -hmm. that they were actually doing like more godly work so it defends nostradamus it defends even merlin in that book which is kind of crazy mm -hmm. but it defends just like hey this is a bad work over here because there was also um especially during the election, there was a lot of like more people talking about God, right? There's been that over the last year. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that more than ever, especially because we, we went through a pandemic of life, right? So people start to, you start to see God being talked about and there's others who don't, right? You, you've seen it more talked about commonly, whereas in I'd say the last 15 years, it kind of was like a, right. we're not talking about that anymore or you're watching the 700 club you know like that was like <laughs> yeah it's either either you don't talk about it or a 700 club there wasn't anything in between correct and mm -hmm. so this this work starts to come out about people starting to talk about god more and stuff and it's kind of it's very interesting to me that the way that history keeps showing is these crazy moments show up in life and the people who speak about god tend to be kind of censored more in a weird way if they have their own version of events that don't go with the events that the common mm -hmm. wealth of the world or the church or a royal monarch because we really can't use like republics that we are in today like in america mm -hmm. as example but that's what's the weirdest part is how much of it is 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 really a republic anymore how much of it is a more centralized 
kind of power structure like we see through the church right or we see through a monarch you know yeah i think we we are kind of dealing with some of the same questions about where is power right now yeah. where is power where where do people have a voice and you know do we do we kind of have values that reflect how people are trying to rule us I mean, it's it's right. like in um, Dante, right? So Dante obviously had an issue with his time because there was outright warfare, literally, over who's going to control the church. Right. And um, I d and then Roger Twisden over here, right? He lives through an era where the king gets his head chopped off. Yeah, and, and he then, used to serve. On the, in the parliament in the House For, of under Commons, yeah, under yeah, Charles, Charles the first, the first. Uh -huh. and then to see the monarch that he's serving in the parliament under it, his head chopped off. I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? And he, you know, conveniently was too old to fight in the Civil War. He was, as he said, but he was like a guide, and he also was. But you know, if you look at that today, right? There's a lot of people talking about whether it was the pandemic or everything. Like they were. They weren't in, in PPE or anything on the ground, but they were up in Congress screaming at the top of their lungs about what would need to be done and what has to be done. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at like a Robert Twisden of a Roger Twisden of that time of, oh, I'm not going to be in there, but I'm don't worry. I'm putting out <laughs> my messages and I'm not over there. I'm not. But, in but the, back then, yeah. you know, he knew how to write, which not a lot of people probably right. did and know how to articulate and deal with Congress or we'll call Congress with the parliament at that time. Right. But what he's doing, okay, so this is what's really interesting about what you just said. Like, what he's doing is he's picking up his pen and paper and writing his book and getting it printed, and he is actually collecting a huge amount of data mm -hmm. about the church, about the laws that have to do with how the English church was established so yeah, that he I'll could show why it's the right church, right? And especially why Elizabeth the First church is the best one. Now, if you like, are, I'm sure maybe somewhere someone's writing rebuttals to whatever's happening right now in the world. But if you put that out on social media and like the press of his day is like the social media, right? It comes out later when he's protected. But are we actually debating now in as much as people did during that time is something to think about because even Dante who was living in an era where he could have really been persecuted, he is, he's writing it and getting persecuted or getting condemned. He is. And he actually was condemned um, to die, but he, then it was forgiven. Um, Which is part so, of his whole divine comedy anyway, because it is a comedy because at the end of the day, through Dante's work out, that, yeah. that we all end up in mm -hmm. the right place with God and that life is basically kind right. of a comedy in itself, right? But what's interesting is, as we're talking about Roger Twisden here, and, you know, there is this, you can just see it on this page. So I'm showing people the cover page here. And I mean, this is about a historical vindication of the Church of England, because that point to that you were talking about earlier is not only is he showing the history, but he's giving a vindication and showing that it wasn't the Church of England that separated from the church. It, he's trying to say that the Catholic Church separated itself from God <laughs> yep. and that the Church of England just kept God going. Yes. And and what's interesting about this is how if you read about it and how it stands uh, separated from the Roman and how Roman is just red as could be. <laughs> right. And, and, and reformed by Elizabeth the first. Yeah. And then what's interesting is there's Charles the second, the defender of the faith. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's because that's the royal seal of that time of the monarch that's in power. And yeah, it's, of and course, done in London, title. printed, yeah. and this is done in uh, 1675. But when you go uh, to his, to the reader, he wrote this from his home, um, which is just to the reader because he technically wrote this. Technically, if we look up the history, it looks like he was in jail at these times when he wrote these books because mm -hmm. they said it was with his books. But he, from my house... Um, May the 2nd of uh, 1657. He was under house arrest, right? Correct. And he didn't make... Well, well, in 1657, he was just at home because it was 1650. Oh, right. He got... He made a deal. But um, this original work, though, was being written 
in the 1640s after 1643 was Sir Charles or I mean uh, King Charles the first head cut off yeah, and then 49. he was in jail and 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 they said he was with his books in 1647 and mm -hmm. then this is 1657 when it is to the reader written but it's it's work that he did while he was in jail right and even the Tower of London at one point yeah and I'm thinking actually too the date is significant because uh, I'm trying to think Oliver Cromwell died in 57 or 58 and um, mm. then his son tries to take over and couldn't hold it and so that's why they invited Charles II back because in the, in the, that's an example of, of how there was this civil war to overthrow the monarchy and there was nothing to take its place. People didn't know what to do in order to establish a new government and actually um, our country is very much informed by uh, everything that happened during the Civil War because it, it gave us a lot of uh, the ideas of what not to do and, right. you know, and it also gave people um, a way to figure out what they believed in and what they stood for. So, I mean, but of course we didn't have an official church, which no. is a very interesting thing about what we did. But I don't remember, uh, back to your thing about the cover page with big Roman and red letters. It's, you know, obviously we're not sitting here saying this is the example of how everybody should be. Correct. But it's just showing how much I mean, he is supporting I mean, Dante's his... work is based off Catholicism and, and based off yeah, the church. I mean, really, right. technically. I mean, because they literally use it. Yeah. Which is kind of ironic that they use a poem. Like, it's poems, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it, it's a fictional story. Right. That is embedded in the church as what they use. It wasn't like purgatory was being talked about prior to Dante. Well, it was, I mean, purgatory was a doctrine in the church, right? Of course, but it but was he not made discre it, he there was no just, it out, right? Yeah, there was no, it wasn't like, uh, there was just massive stories in the Bible about purgatory mm -hmm. or something like that. It wasn't like, you know, in the book of John or anything like that. It wasn't like, you know, oh gosh, this is everything. Mm -hmm. So, we lost a light. There we hey, go. So, so uh, what are we and that, that means we were talking about <laughs> the most sensitive subject. Purgatory. That's where it is right there is that it w was it really being talked about? Like, w was it really like, was it really there or not there? I think it, that people um, obviously wouldn't have had a concrete idea of what is purgatory. But for Dante to actually infer that hey, you know, you're in purgatory right now. Earth is purgatory, is really what he's doing by giving, having all those historical If you just turn it illusions. on and off, it'll probably turn on because it, it's wireless. So. Come back, paradise. We're in purgatory yep. without our there light. But, but yeah, he's given all the examples of what would be purgatory. And for Henry Francis Carey to then in 1804 and 18 whenever you know when he's writing right. this book to come back with the idea of purgatory again to me says there's something else happening in that early 19th century that's making people again think feel that purgatory is a relevant um, concept right right that life on earth isn't paradise and so people are starting to think you know it's not it's not hell but it's like the in-between zone it's that in-between zone and I mean, I, you know, it's like, I'm not going to just sit here and just give away the, there was a, there's a lot of spiritual, amazing nuggets that are in my presentation, mm -hmm. but one of them that I'll give out as like a little English toffee or something, like a little cup of tea, yes, <laughs> would be that you don't have to live in that purgatory mm. and that that's what that presentation does is show people that you know, the weird things that are happening in this world today are purgatory based. And they really do connect with those seven sins. And and what's very weird is how we you talked about earlier. It's not like we're trying to show, you know, which way to go mm -hmm. or something like that, because both versions here are totally opposite of each other. Right. And we're looking at the best of both. And what what, what can we do to figure out life better, especially in a moment like this? But I would say that, you know, a lot of it is to not be afraid to to go your your own direction here, like because 
it works out for both of them. It works out in a way that their history is written. They're, and even H. F. Uh, Carey, Reverend H. F. Carey, his 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 dissertation of Dante's work, even though he never got it published in 1814, and I don't think he lived to see it. This book that no. we have here published, and he had to self-publish it when it came out. Yeah. yeah, which means, especially back in the 1800s, it wasn't like self-publishing. It was mm -hmm. like today, like yeah, put an Instagram ad about it and put but it on know, Amazon. You know what's like? You know what I mean? Like, uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually sold it for pretty cheap. I was reading that. I think it was 12 shillings, which wasn't a huge amount, right. and they and it was a small version so that it could be portable. Um, right. I was reading all about that. Mary Shelley actually had a copy of that edition of Dante, and she's the one who wrote Frankenstein. And I wanted mm. to kind of talk about connections between that too. But Well, I thought we would just show them one sec about the Lancelot thing. Okay. Just for a sec. Um, be because when you and I did look at this part of it, it was kind of interesting on how Dante... Dante had a girl that he was friends with named Beatrice. It was the love of his life. It was the love of his child. life, but it was almost like friend zoned. <laughs> well, because he was betrothed to someone else and she was too. Yeah. So, you know, you know it was like just friends. Have you ever seen that movie? Mm, I don't think so. Who, or maybe who's in it? Um, what's his name? Um, uh, what's his name from just friends? Uh, uh, but he's, he's an amazing comedian. I don't know why I can't think of his name because we're in so many names lately. Names have been hard for the last couple of weeks. Mercury Retrograde, too. Uh, what's his, uh, he's in a, mi a million movies. Um, Ryan Reynolds. Um, Ryan Reynolds, and he's he's really fat when he's in high school. I think, And then yeah. he becomes like a Hollywood big shot, and he comes back home to his hometown, and then the girl that was always friends with him that he never could get, yeah. he has to try and get her back, but now he's acting like, like the shell of him being thin and cool is <laughs> revealing who he really is. He's mm -hmm. still the nerd, uh, you know, fat kid from high school. Of course, that movie today won't go out, stuff like that, because everybody's so sensitive. So, but again, and I, I feel like, you know, censorship something that has been a big prediction of mine from way before we started seeing it in 2020. Like, right. Like, you know, I, I count, pounded it for a long time, but another, you know, kind of crazy part of the life that we're living through right now is like even in the the stories the, the everything is, is being very um propagated into yeah no we want you to look at this and this is how mm -hmm. life should be through stories through movies through television shows through through everything you know there's that whole game of thrones like right before the pandemic if you really think about it, it was all about game of thrones and game of thrones and this whole build-up about capturing who's the who's the ultimate one that's going to sit on the iron throne um and it's so interesting to mm -hmm. me that astrologically it was the build-up to the jupiter pluto saturn conjunction and you know at the end of the day even when daenerys she and gets the gets the throne i mean it's not like she really does it's like when people take power too far mm -hmm. there's always something that the universe especially god i feel just goes yank i mean in her case john snow kills her mm -hmm. so you know and she ends up burning the whole town. And I like King's Landing, by the way. If I had to live anywhere, I would, I would definitely live in King's Landing. <laughs> but I just think it's interesting that we're, we're we're in that kind of way. And then even this story of Dante's, you know, uh, his three works and, and all of his work. But I, I do like how H.F. Carey does put this as like the vision, mm -hmm. of Dante, which is basically this whole vision right. in, in yeah. one, encompassing it more in a one because that's, I think, the difference between the Church of England and the Catholic Church would be th there's not so many pieces to the puzzle of finding God as there is in or what you have to do, right, at Catholic Church. Whereas, you know, Church of England, it's pretty basic. It's just like you, your church, your, your, the, the, the folk that you all pray to God with and Jesus and Mm -hmm. the, the minister or the reverend and that's about it it's not like you have to do much you, you, have to, you don't have to go eat the eat, eat the bread and drink the wine and then you also you don't do, have to do but you just got to do it once well, once a, yeah well, at the beginning but i'm saying yeah. that the, the ref you know over time mm -hmm. we see it now to where you know anything that's really more formed i guess you could say that's not mm -hmm. this is interesting this page is 
Nobody ever read that page Nobody over all Nobody ever read this page years. in all these hundreds of years, and it's stuck. Um, Actually, it's still printed to each other. That's crazy. Wow. Well, I guess that wasn't an, um, was not an important page. Well, um, actually, it's interesting because if I try to look in between, there actually is a page. So it's not yeah. like it's like a two-page thing. But you got to get like a you like Craig's just, little knife you know out what? there. Yeah, no, I just, I just, I just Mars and Scorpio'd it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it worked. I was gonna say though, because um, you had talked about censorship now, and I thought about a couple of things historically. Right now, I think even though we have more ways to communicate with each other than ever, that means the technology is there to be able to be to censor more than ever. Um, because I think I'm thinking about how in this era, like in Dante's era, or even in Henry Francis Carey's era, if you were going to censor, you could even maybe not the 19th century, but earlier, if you were going to censor, you could mark it out and and let people even read it and but they would know don't believe that part because there was a uniform belief system still and now we don't really have that so we can't really um we can't depend on people to get the correct idea so we have to censor it more heavily but so right now you want to sh you're showing the picture of oh no i was just getting it set up i think that I, I, yeah, I think it's the technology and so forth, but I actually think that the ultimate sensor is ourself and whether or not we have the courage as a person. Yeah. Because, that, mm -hmm. because that's what the history shows to me is like, I don't care what the technology is or what the algorithms are trying to sniff or what the, you know, the media tells you to do or what your neighbors are going to judge you by. Like that's all the same traits of things. Maybe it wasn't technology or back then, you know what? Maybe it was harder to get published, right? Because you had to get money or shillings right, to be able to do it or to even have like a group of people because it was not like one person was printing a book. Like there was a group of people that made books mm -hmm. that, did, that did publishing where today, you know, they send it to, oh yeah, get it just done in China. Like just get a printed paperback real quick at some factory. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like that. It was like there was, it was, these books were made like pieces of, of art. Right. But I feel like everything comes to the individual and whether or not they have the guts to speak out their truth. And I think that during these times, I mean, we're talking literally on the eve that's coming up here in the next 24 hours of a solar eclipse in Gemini mm -hmm. with Mercury retrograde in Gemini right on top of it. It's an interesting moment here of discussion that this is this is the moment in life where people have to really go. Am I living my truth in all areas of my life? Mm -hmm. Because when you do, then you don't have the fear to speak truth because what I noticed in Dante's work, obviously he was very well connected to who he was as an individual. He had done a lot of searching on his inside. When I look at Roger Twisden in this, in that book, he had done a lot of work and, and especially wasn't afraid to speak his truth. And he went to jail multiple times right. where Dante had the death facing him right. or even just not even being looked at as being, you know, godly maybe because he got went the other way. But it works out for for everybody usually in the end. I mean, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But even uh, you could look at, you know, some people think JFK was, was assassinated because he was a president who spoke a little bit too much truth, you mm -hmm. know. But at the same time, you never know. I mean, it's kind of interesting that both uh, presidents right now, from Joe Biden to uh, JFK, that are the last – and they're in the same cycle and they're both Catholics and, the, and there's always the, the, the curse of Tippecanoe, which I did that presentation for free era of Providence. You could watch. And that was my biggest concern about whoever was president. You know, there's like, there is a presidential curse of Jupiter, Saturn. Mm -hmm. And then I show it that it's maybe not death, but that it's always a weird thing or, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so funny too, that in, in every era, we also think, we know it, so we can control it now. It's just like the stock market issues now, right. or you know, we think, yeah, people in the past, they had curses or they couldn't control things, but we can now. Or people in the past had to deal with disease, but we can control it now. We can stop it. It's just like <laughs> demonology. I mean, that, 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 and if you haven't watched exactly. yet, we ha it's free yeah. on YouTube, it's on High Vibe, it's free. Uh, History in the Stars, look it up. Uh, we did demonology and, the 
King James Bible, I think, was what we mm-hmm. covered it about. But that whole demonology book, which came before he wrote the King James Bible, I mean, literally it was because he couldn't go get the woman that he wanted because mm-hmm. of storms that he thought witches created the storms and creates this whole entire book about demons. And I mean, and it's how funny. we can yeah. look for them and control them. <laughs> I know how we can look for them and control them. Exactly. <laughs> right. And there's very similarities uh, during that time to what we're seeing now, too. It's almost like you and I had this talk and I don't know if you remember, but it's almost like all these very crazy and important moments in time that are fascinating for people who love history are all happening at this one moment right now. It's almost like mm-hmm. all history is compressed. And that actually comes from Terrence McKenna. And he had this idea, ironically enough, 40 years ago now, of time wave zero, that time was compressing itself. Because hmm. the idea of compression came to computers of like, taking like a CD, remember, and burning it to an MP3 or making it, compressing it to an MP3, and then Napster, like sending that little file. But that was even before that. It was the idea of compre- like how are we going to get information and compress it enough for a computer? Right. And his mind was so wide enough at the time in his soul that he was looking at history and how time also is evolving and how much faster things were going with history. But he was using the I Ching that the Chinese use and also in human design, the I Ching is used and running algorithms with it and looking at time and the history and the I Ching, but also this compression wave that everything in 2012 was coming to a zero point Mm -hmm. that it was like, there was a wave of time that you could take back from the beginning of what we know as mankind that like six days prior to December 21st, 2012 was all compressing. And then the six days between that was compressing onto that and that we would reach the zero point. And ever since 2012, it just feels like just everything has just gone into, you know, it's almost like we're floating in all periods of time whenever we want in many ways, but they're, they're only connected to where really are deeper connections to patterns that we can see in history with astrological detail Mm -hmm. because that's how we define our time is through the planets and the if you want to just use the sun and the and the earth Hmm. right it makes me think of that art i know this this is going off of that picture but it makes me think of the article that you sent me from michael luton about going back to 15 Oh, uh, his work on Eris right now and going back to Christopher Columbus and going back to the Eris return of where we're at with Eris at 23 Aries and 24 Mm -hmm. Aries and then what's coming up over the years of what's going to happen in that same spot. Also Mm -hmm. with Chiron that's entering and the, uh, you know, he did a very, I don't want to give away all his work because you have to purchase it, but he did some amazing work on his, on his Eris, um, element of things right now in Aries and how more importantly enough looking at that spot and what's coming up for America in the future and when is it going to have its I guess you could call it like reset point where people are going to be like is it not going to be so crazy anymore Mm -hmm. like he does a good way of like helping people see but also there's uh I like the way that he used the well it's (laughs) it's history that actually is connected to astrology of Christopher Columbus and you know showing up to a new world and like there is that element of like what an asshole he was and and his journals and what he wrote about the the people that lived you know Mm -hmm. the natives that lived there and he he came there looking for gold chiron and taurus and there was no gold Hmm. you know and he Mm -hmm. didn't see the gold in the people that were super nice and wanted to help him and he wrote about them as really i can't even say the things that he said right so but but it's interesting because it's Right now in this period, in this time, I mean, it feels like we are in all history happening at once, especially like the most significant events that really kind of define massive change in human history itself and how we, whether it's we rule or govern or how we as people handle the world at large. And it's more about what humans are doing to other humans. If you really take a look at it at the end of the day, And also the human connection to God and also the human disconnection from God and trying to control things like it's, it really just comes down to those things. I mean, people always hit me up worried about natural disasters and Mm -hmm. uh, worried about, you know, money and yeah, those things happen. But 
the main thing that I keep seeing as a recurring theme is is is, is how humans interact with, with with control or humans connect with God. And there's a lot of censorship. The more that I look back in my history as an adult now, but I'm I'm going to be 37 this year. I actually believe that the uh, people who speak about God has been more censored than I realized. And then it took me history and it took me looking at the patterns in history in the books to actually realize that there has been, especially since I'm a Hollywood guy who's been on a lot of Hollywood TV shows and reality shows and been in, I've been in and out of the whole thing that I can tell you that they don't want you to talk about it. They want you to go and be distracted into their version of life, which is creating this idea of what an idol would be or right. what to, mm -hmm. and, and, and really purgatory really is those seven sins. Hmm. So they're creating, they don't want you to talk about religion because they want to create whatever's the religion, right? They're Correct. helping to create whatever it is we're all going to believe in. Right. And they use all the forms of the sins of purgatory mm -hmm. and keep people trapped in between the spaces, really. Of so course, I'm not going to give away the, the powerful ones that I, I right. connect the time that they're in the presentation or more importantly, the work that I did. Because that's just like, I can't even say it here on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But... You can see it once you have the wherewithal to find those patterns. And, and like, if we could show real quick, Craig, so this is the picture of Lancelot, why I bought this book. This is Dante. It's not Lancelot, but it's Dante and Beatrice, his friend, who, of course, he wishes he was more than a friend. <laughs> but they're reading the story of Lancelot, and which is kind of interesting to me because I don't, I don't know if that's actually in Dante's work or not. I think it is. I think it is, which is kind of crazy since his work is what, all the way back at the 1300s. So the story of King Arthur and, and the Knights of the Round Table really do mm -hmm. come from a long time ago. Right. That it's not just some little thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we even take a look at this picture here, I mean, this is a depiction of um, Sir Galahad and his knights on the Grail Quest. But as they're reading that, the book of uh, uh, the story of Lancelot. They look at each other in their eyes and it's about Lancelot and Guinevere and their story, but they have to put the book down. Right. Because this is part of Inferno, actually not purgatory. Oh, that's and right. if, if I'm correct, um, it is, yeah, it yeah. is, it is part of, it is part of, um, yeah, it is part of hell. Oh yeah. Hell. <laughs> um, hell to be reading about Lancelot and Guinevere. Well, and that the whole point was because of, uh, you know, being in hell would be like to be with somebody who you shouldn't be with because that's, you know, not godly. And, and then themselves almost carrying that energy within themselves over. And then, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, here I can zoom out, yeah. But at the bottom of it, it says, um, for delight, we read of Lancelot. <laughs> well, and, and Henry got to choose which parts of the book he was going to elaborate on. And if you look at it, I was looking at it earlier against a, a translation of Dante that's very straightforward. And what um, Carey does in his version is he makes it much more flowery and vision-like. Yes. Like it's very visual in the way and he describes easier things. to to understand from an english speaking mm -hmm. point of view or mindset because right because he's going to foreground lance a lot and have beatrice and dante reading yes because most right? of the da the dante work you know you, you just see fallen angels and you see you, you know you see the fallen angels down in inferno mm -hmm. like down with creepy looking you know they're not angels anymore they're beasts with wings like right that are like salivating in like caves of mm -hmm. disgusting inferno i mean basically <laughs> right and lost souls it's not even really about that. fire either which yeah. i've always uh you know kind of laughed at is the idea of fire with hell when really it's cold because astrologically mm -hmm. and men and women of that time would have known that 
you know saturn rules coldness like it's that that that, that hell or sa mm -hmm. satan which rules of course you know saturn is is the one that the ruler of cold mm -hmm. being cold since you brought that up i have to say that uh one of the things i noticed while i was doing research on that book is um charles dickens was actually influenced by this by this version of dante by henry henry C carey's version really in writing a christmas carol and that was written let's see uh, i wrote that down 1843 and at that time or right before he was writing it he would have gone to the british museum which is where henry francis carey was working at the time because mm. he had to retire from his church job and he got a job at the british museum so charles dickens would come there to read to to use the library and study and do research and people think that he probably talked to carey while he was there Interesting. But so his his description of Scrooge is like Satan from Inferno, which is ve he's very Capricornian, just right mm -hmm. during Christmas, which is Capricorn, right? Which he's bah humbug and coal, and, mm -hmm. you know, like doesn't I like the 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 the, the Disney version with Mickey though? Me too. You know, I mean that I think that and one Donald described Duck, it better. Right? Yeah, or I just, Scrooge McNuck. Scrooge McDuck, yeah, yeah and, and and with with Mickey and how good of a employee he is, but he gets scraps, mm -hmm. and Scrooge having to look at that way, or of course there's Scrooge the movie, you know, that was mm -hmm. really well done with Bill Murray, which is awesome. Yeah, but, scared my children to death. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but that's interesting to me because it, I was thinking of 1843. If that's the time period, and that was uh, Neptune in, in Aquarius before it went to Pisces in 1848. Huh. And it's really interesting because if you think about since 2011, when we saw Neptune and Pisces now, a lot of the stories, a lot of the, even if you think of Christmas today and stuff like that, like a lot of that stuff, just when you get into Neptune and Pisces, we go into this like no man's land, but also this fantasy land at the same time. But a lot of things kind of get feel like they're pushed out of the the understanding or the ether, like just like, well, you kind of have to go back into time, into your memories like it's mm -hmm. almost more like a memory than it is like, oh, yeah, we're going to sing the Christmas carol and da, 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 and going into stories of that. Like there's mm -hmm. something about like I hate to say it, but if you look at Neptune and Aquarius at the time, which was the build up until 2011, which is the 2000s. Right. You know. Feels like did that happen? You know, it, it did. But, you know, you almost it brings you back to mm -hmm. getting out of the weird numbness that Neptune and Pisces can bring. Like so people people like to listen to on their Spotify, like I do stuff prior to 2011. Cause there's something about it that brings you back to when you weren't in this crazy fog. Hmm. Yeah. And that's, um, I mean, I do, I'm sure by, by then by Neptune and Pisces, people would have had, um, a Christmas Carol as something they had Correct. as part of their life. Yeah. Right. But it's so interesting how it does have that whole dreamlike element to it. Right. It does. And you're going back to the to Christmas past. And um, the other part that I was thinking, which is very Dante it's just for like, sure. yeah, that's what this person I was reading in an article where they compared the stories and how going through his life, reviewing the life was like Dante going being led through Inferno and Purgatory right. and Paradise. It's that same device. And then I thought about, um, you know, when the ghost of Christmas present lifts up his robes and you see those cr scary little children under there who are. I know. I looked it up. They're want in ignorance and want, which are kind which of are like. The very purgatory, uh, lustful mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And what I was going to say about this picture of Dante with Beatrice and it actually is even drawn almost like it is Lancelot and Guinevere mm -hmm. it's how the media and the Hollywood pushes the stories they want you to be like to make them okay right so it's right. almost like you know you see in movies like oh it's okay like I'm gonna end this or I'm gonna do that or we're gonna do this or it's okay to you know what well, I don't want to like have any judgment so I'm just gonna throw out just like things that don't attach anybody but it's just like you know just like stories or movies or music or music videos or whatever that really take you 
and then people try to look like that or they try to act like that or they try to be that right and in this and in this it's almost like they actually start looking at each other and start gazing into each other's eyes as if like this is what to do but he's betrothed to somebody else and i think beatrice was too with already with somebody else too so it was like were they about to really go down into you know a fair life you know what i mean and it's like they, they talks about them having to put the book down right and then the energy between them just instantly disconnects and instantly goes into this feeling for him is the pit of hell that it's the pit of hell either way mm -hmm. that he goes into talking about which i was like wow that's pretty deep yeah that means he's not happy with who, who he's with already mm -hmm. and, and i think that's a good lesson for people that you can sit in hell even even when you're like oh i'm doing the right thing but mm -hmm. it's still hell because you want to do that yet that's because there's another situation going on that you're not facing which is hell itself right yeah that's i mean and and to think that people are having those feelings back in oh, all day. Dante's era and then in the Today, 19th century Over the last 10,000 personal readings I've done in 10 years? Yeah. Oh, 7,000 plus of those I could say is that story. How sad. To me, it's not sad. To me, it's like that's why so many people are unhappy. So that's not and sad. that and to me it was the whole Saturn Pluto I talked about this a little and this is like some people might be like oh god you're talking about this it scares people when I talk about it mm -hmm. that you know 2019 and 2020 of Saturn Pluto coming together was the ending of the Saturn Pluto Jupiter and Libra which was 83 and 84 1900s 1983 mm -hmm. 1984 <laughs> Back then. and that that period up until 2019 2020 was the end of relationships and these stupid games that we play and these okay. feelings that we all have to feel like we have to do and the idea that you know especially you just see the building of you know relationships going to all different kind of crazy ways and i mean i ironically enough was on dating reality shows and you see dating apps you see back then that was kind of the you looked in the newspaper and there were dating ads and mm -hmm. you could meet that way um you know, you see people in relationships realizing, you know, either this, in, this huge imbalance of what relationships are and also this obsessive idea of what they are too. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, unless I, you know, the dress and the wedding and it has to look this certain way and, you know, it became a fat. Look at the bachelor and the bachelorette. And right. all, like, like it became this just obsession, mm -hmm. which um, thank God it's, now, but now it's Capricorn, which is, and I hate to tell people, but it's going to be government and it's going to be, you know, talk about government and control and power and financial structures and, you know, which is a lot more boring. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's why you see a lot of people today like, I don't want to. So it's all flipped, right? Like a lot of women like to watch The Bachelor and The Bachelorette and a lot of dudes are like, ah, I don't want to watch that show <laughs> unless I'm going to hook up with you and all, you know, whatever. Right. I'm just being real. <laughs> But like now you see girls like, I don't want to hear all this politics talk. I want to watch something really nice. But it's like, that's the switch. And it's, like, it's politics everywhere. Is this ever going away? It's kind of like how we were all like, is this ever going away? All these like soap operas about these relationship situations and uh, the mm -hmm. Lifetime movies and da, 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 relationship, 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 relationship. <laughs> like that's what it was about for the last 37 years. So even all it, the movies were all about love stories and notebook. Right? And even in Top Gun, it's not really about fighting jet as much as it is about like his falling in love with charlie or da, da, da. everything from that point was about relationships all the way through even in the matrix it's about oh no neo and trinity and their love story mm -hmm. and that's what gets him to make the choice when he's with the architect like everything so that's where it's so mind-blowing to me how many people like that's one portion of this book that's very small right so that's not the main portion the main portion is the control of where the control and power is and also of the divine destiny mm -hmm. of our lives, which is also the other part of this now, which is a destined course that things are destined and so forth. But but they're controlling themselves. So they've obviously internalized the church's ideology or correct. whatever it is that. And so what's funny about that is they've internalized that and that kind of is in place in Dante's mm -hmm. book, but he's challenging the government by writing right. it in these ways. So was it a similar astrological thing then that was 
Well, allowing... if you think about it, he was born in 1265. Mm -hmm. And as he's coming into his, well, 1307 and then to 1310 was like the end of the Knights Templar, right? So he was, he was around, he was alive and he was doing this work then. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of like how the Knights Templar had done things kind of their own way went against the church and were killed so mm -hmm. that's significant to him so there was a lot and then that's the same stuff we're seeing today if so. you start touting off that you like the right you know it, you're an insurrectionist now right you know and you're gonna or if you like the left right then you're a a, a, a traitor to america and mm -hmm. you're you're for the chinese right so you know it, it's it's, it's happening right in front of our faces at the moment. That's one thing that's, I think, funny about history is, is we're living history right. now. And we're living a bigger part of history than I think that has ever been told. Mm -hmm. But the hard part about it is who's with the media and with TV and with Internet. And with mainly most pe most of the people doing that. I mm -hmm. mean, what's really going to be archived correctly as records and how are they how are we are those and can those records could all be lost at one you know it's I mean? just it's so interesting because i think about that as a historian that um for a really long time people looking at the history of this era right they wouldn't like if i was a 19th century historian i probably wouldn't look at dante an, an, an adaptation of dante as a historical source but now i would so it makes me wonder if people are going to be looking at official records for this history and then realize, oh, look at all this vast data of from the internet or are they gonna or are they gonna be telling the story from already looking at what's on YouTube? Are they gonna not even realize that there was the news media out there? Well it or, reminds me of those two know? those two doctors from Bakersfield who I think it was April of twenty twenty, they made that video telling people like, you know, they actually have their own practice and they focus on them unit, you know the immune system and biology and so forth. And they did a very, very good video of helping people be like, don't live in a bubble. They're telling you to wipe down your counters and everything. Like there's good bacteria, there's good stuff. And you also like want to live in life, like to build your immune system. Mm -hmm. That if we live in this bubble, you know, once you go back out in the world, your immune system is going to be taxed and it won't know how to deal with it because it'll take on something that usually is normally taken on and it'll take you down. And they got booted off YouTube, right? And everybody shared their stuff. I think even he, I think it was even Elon Musk who shared that video, and um, it was kind of crazy because they were. It wasn't like they had a political agenda, mm -hmm. but there's been so much of this. Like, no, it didn't come from the CDC. No, nope, didn't come from the FDA. Which is an emergency act. It's not an actual. I'm sorry to say it's not an actual approval right so that's what's going to be interesting are those kind of videos that you know people are carrying on and like rumble is another website mm -hmm. that's like a youtube and stuff like that that it's out there but you know right now there's this um kind of the way i look at more of the history i would say not from dante's period because that's a little difficult 1300 i mean if we just take that for an example that's not a really big time where people are walking around talking about great revels of ideas of the universe and the world and spirituality in a way because they can't even read and that's why the the, the church had control because the most of the, the bibles were in latin mm -hmm. and they had to go to a priest that actually understood how to read it so they, they it's not like you know outside of it they might talk about what's in church but they're also not like going out and writing or they're not making a video or they're not standing out i mean it takes a long time till you get to you know 15 17 martin luther to be like okay i'm nailing this on the church and i'm saying but what there I'm gonna are say. what's funny is there's inquisition records yes where all those people gave testimony and man there were some wild ideas and especially out there. yeah and there were and and especially how many women have been killed over time too mm -hmm. for just being able to, to to speak out there was a huge time where you know if women spoke out against anything that the church wanted to be like you were just automatically thrown in the back of a wagon and bye bye and how we don't even know the real records of how many millions right. of women were killed for that yeah but it's surprising how many voices are there like how much was recorded 
and right. it just takes the perception of the person looking for the evidence if it's if the evidence is preserved it'll be really i mean it's already interesting looking at all these different stories right it's now. almost like you can see that they know this so they write it however they want because it's more opinion pieces now than journalism yeah. or and, and and really nobody's using history at all in the media zero well, the only are, history they, they're, they're choosing is very weird history that goes nothing in along with the astrology like I have nothing against it, but I'm just saying like they just went into the Tulsa thing that was a hundred year anniversary or whatever. But it's like, why aren't we looking at what happened at uh, bloody Kansas? You know, because like that's exactly what happened in the astrology and that's exactly what's happening now. Or what happened to Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, which we'll talk or with Edgar Allan Poe, which that, that could be on the next one, definitely, <laughs> especially in 1849 when he passed. Yeah. Which is ironically enough, just, uh, yeah, what, like four, five six years prior to Charles Dickinson. Hmm. Well, what was happening? I was wondering about, um, what is it? So Henry Francis Carey was born in 1772 in Gibraltar, which is interesting. And then he, he has, yeah. he was born where Pluto is basically has been over the last two years of our life. Like, you know, like, although actually that's, yeah, like, because, like, we're getting to the Pluto return, which is 1776, so four years prior. Yeah, he, 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 he was born with a Pluto at the place that we would have seen life like we saw over the last, like, four years, like, 2016, hmm. 2017. Wow. And, and so, you know, he was born at this time before this massive revolution, literally, mm -hmm. in the idea of the world that a whole entire, um, you know, the 13 colonies would, would rebel against the reign of a monarch and create their own government and govern themselves, which would have been more in an English ideas, you know, mind, like this feels like Charles the first, like they're going to go try and do it themselves. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, they, like, yeah. they, uh, huh. like, but, but, but they're also across the, the, the whole entire other side of the world. So it's not like, what are they going to come over here and cut off, you know, uh, the head of the king? No. Well, then they had they actually were worrying about that during his life right. because the French Revolution happened and people were guillotined in Paris. Of course. So, yeah, but that's like, you know, time. that's how they would have looked at it. Yeah. But I think he was American, right? No, he was, he's, no, he no, was he's, born in he's, Gibraltar. Oh, no, he's, he's in English. Yeah, he's and in he, English. And it that's was right. December sixth, so, also. Right, but he doesn't really get into talking about the revolution at all. So, but he also would have been young. Mm -hmm. But the whole British Empire shifted at that point because they had to go then develop the Indian colonies, right. and then they used Australia as a penal colony, and right. a lot of things were shifting. And Canada too. They they that's where they really put their grip on Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which so, they have a big grip still on today. <laughs> right. So, I mean, so I'm, it's like that was a big shift in terms of the whole government. But also, if you think about that's the same era where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein and how Dante, how Dante, his work on his translation of Dante really influenced a lot of the romantic poets hmm. and people like Mary Shelley who, um, what she was more interested in looking at that effort of humans to control right. to control nature to be gods and how that can turn out like frankenstein's monster it's true and it's a rare book in itself just this hf carry version because it was published after his death and finally for the first time like actually published mm -hmm. like widely but right. but but in many sense it's kind of interesting because what the antique store that I bought it from says it's super rare. It's not a commonly found book. Like you mm -hmm. just don't go into some store and go, mm -hmm. yeah, let me get H.F. Carey, uh, Dante's The Vision. <laughs> Why do you think 1888 they would have republished it? What was happening astrologically then? Well, so you have Jupiter Saturn in 1880. Uh, Grant comes in and then he gets assassinated and you move through there it's before theodore roosevelt you, I'm, of course i'm more of an american history guy yeah. but you know you, you're at the teeter tot point you have edison mm -hmm. you have um you have you have you have you have the world in wonder of moving into the industrial revolution 
completely and, and, globalized and, and globalized yeah. connections and trade not being so merchandy with merchant ships mm -hmm. like that are sailboats anymore they're moving into wow these are coal-based boats or steamboats yeah you start moving into a world that's rapidly advancing so fast because of the fact that if you look at pluto it was about to come into the biggest changes of our lives like because Pluto uh, was in Gemini at that time. Maybe mm -hmm. Taurus. Let me think here. So, uh, yeah, it would have been the, the Taurus into Gemini. And that would have been because if you look at Adolf Hitler's birthday, he was 1880. Right there, and he was born with Pluto in Gemini right at the beginning. So it would have been the transition from Pluto. Like we're going right now. We're about to transition from Pluto to Capricorn to Aquarius. Mm -hmm. It would have been the transition from Pluto to Taurus to Pluto and Gemini. And it would have been this, okay, like we can build things to – Let's figure out what we could do with the things we build. Hmm. And an obsession with that. And also mm -hmm. an obsession with communication, which was a big thing. Because, sure, they had Morse code. But you, you, you rapidly advance to, here's your telegram, sir or ma'am. Right. Like, whoa. Hmm. Took a week, but <laughs> I got the writing of somebody, right. you know. That's And it's so... It was so modern, too, that that's a period of time when there is this uh, reaction against modernity and mm -hmm. like we're sitting in this whole kind of William Morris pre-Raphaelite kind of set which was a reaction actually to that time they brought back this interest in the middle ages and gothic architecture and, they did. and natural things handcrafted art and or hand well, handcrafted furniture and, and that's stuff. that's Gemini in many sense to t Taurus to Gemini right it's mm -hmm. like Taurus at the end of it really is about like uh as the late jeff jower the astro one of the best astrologers that i've ever known um who passed he told me with my moon at the end of taurus and i'm like a crusty old taurus moon but more importantly that i like it's like a truffled a truffled energy at the end of taurus it's like truffle cakes and truffle <laughs> this and truffle that everything's mm -hmm. like that very fine fine wine at the mm -hmm. highest degree right or you know and that's something that i like in my life like I, there's something i like dream of a parlor or a den or a, some study or mm -hmm. the richness of of even it doesn't matter really what the times are i mean like the other set over there is more of what i align with like an indiana jones kind of a vibe but there's something about the end of Taurus into Gemini that there is that energy and we're seeing the North Node approach that we're seeing we're seeing that in bars or restaurants that tend to kind of go back to the older look right that's cool and adding a little modern touch mm -hmm. we see it in people's homes now people don't want you know a 1990s leather couch with big recliners with the you know it's like with their eyes no their or the the <laughs> seashell uh you know like like lampshades and right. you Some know people might not that i don't know that. i don't know how much <laughs> of that's around anymore from where i'm looking at but you see you know older vintage lights or light bulbs yeah. or you know things things changing and, and i think that there's that's how i would correlate it with it like, i think people have to realize that the generational aspects and time Pluto really does hold and, and it really does change a whole generation and it changes also the the vibration of what we live through I mean because if you go into the beginning of the 1900s and when Pluto finally arrives in cancer I mean you get the Great Depression you get you get the you know people just trying to find a job like it's mm -hmm. just like and, and it's about the family having to stick together and oh my gosh right we're now we're in the opposite it's like oh yeah i, I don't know i don't like this job i quit yesterday i'm gonna see if yeah i'm going to craigslist i'm going on this or another guy's a job for me and then you see like the family like oh it's nice to see you maybe i'll see you in a couple of years a week two months four or years. remind me to call my dad after yeah. this I haven't right to exactly because everybody's <laughs> got their own destinies yeah. that they're they're figuring out so you know, I would say that Pluto, and that was what Hitler's issue was, was he didn't include Pluto in the chart mm. because it was found in 1930 and there wasn't a lot of astrologers that knew much about Pluto yet, let alone the astronomers that had found it. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
he had Pluto at the beginning of Gemini, and when Uranus went right there, psh, boom, he went crazy, and went all you know. He which house would would it have been in for him? I was like s at the end of his seventh house into his eighth house, but mm -hmm. if we use his Libra rising, um, technically it would have been into his ninth house uh, whole sign, which would have like been his beliefs going crazy and mm -hmm. rampant, right? Or his 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 one thing about the ninth house or even Sagittarius can also be like, um, believe it or not, like being so, um, of course, so hardcore in your belief, but at the same time can be, uh, I guess you could say, uh, whether it's racist or right, right. Cause when you get that hardcore like in a belief extreme, and you can get um, you can get lost in pretty wild ideas and beliefs that, but especially for him in Gemini in the ninth, that that's Libra's thing, right? Is like, in order to weigh out the truth, you have to be able to look at all things in the courtroom, and you have to want to look at all the evidence before you judge. That's one beautiful thing about Libra is it's opposite of all the signs because every house is opposite. So if you're a Libra rising or a Libra. Why is Aries your relationship? Because you have to identify with who you are to be with the right partner. If you try to be as a Libra with a partner that's not who you identify with as a person, you're fucked. Hmm. Or if you go to the eighth house, which would be right after that, you go to Taurus, like it's like if you really don't have passion for it, then you're not gonna find any value in it and you're not you're gonna feel like your self worth is just ripped away. Hmm. You know, so it it, it Libra, Libra's judgment is very beautiful because it takes all the zodiac and flips it on its ass and goes, let's look at it from the other side of it. But also, as a judge, you must, you just can't believe something without looking at facts. That's why the third house is Sag. Like, oh my gosh, that's the house of Gemini, but it's Sag's house. So you have to understand mm -hmm. factual evidence to back up the claim of the belief. Or you go to the fourth house of Capricorn, which is so opposite. It should be cancer. No. In order for it, like, are you really in a place to where that is a foundation that you can grow from and have authority in your life? Because if a Libra is in a place where, uh-oh, it's too cold and it doesn't feel comfortable, but they're keeping them in line hmm. from going to, with Aquarius fifth house, too crazy with their love or too crazy with their ideas of mm -hmm. fantasy of fun Libras can get really lost because their 12th house is Virgo from reality well that makes that makes a lot of sense to but it's also a, a test of reality to, and that's interesting and to see if reality is even real hmm. that's the secret of Libras they're the keepers of what's really real in reality and what's really not hmm they're the only ones that have the secret codes of actually being like, that's really not real. But most Libras can get caught up in the reality and that's their subconscious issue is that they have to get out of reality to look at it from another angle. Yeah, I agree. With, I think that that's something I had to learn how to do for sure. That yeah. it's um, in, And in Dante, to bring it back to that, I noticed he mentioned Libra as a constellation. Yeah. Where I don't think he mentioned another one, so I have to well, look at that and I passage think again. Because Spike, Spike, the star that's in Libra that defines it, 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 it's, it's, it's a beautiful, dainty, like star, and I'm sure he connects it in there to parody, to parody, to parody. So, but it also is the highest star above the ecliptic because of the fact that it has a higher energy of judgment but it's also a balance beam on the ecliptic in many ways because it has it that's where scorpio goes below the ecliptic and you end hmm. into the depths of the darkness so and the sun's death goes to the judgment and dies starts to get poisoned in scorpio by the kiss of the poison from a scorpion but you see that in the zodiac you see that in the way that the sun actually is on the horizon and you see that in the astrology of the zodiacs themselves and the plays that they are players that they are mm -hmm. so that, that is interesting well anyway we're gonna be doing a lot more deeper dives and especially uh we'll be, we're gonna continue for high vibers we have a special show we're gonna do just for this so definitely become a member of high vibe but 
I think we wanted to show this to everybody about what we're doing and especially also to reinstate. If you have not watched Rising Through the Darkness Purgatory yet, it's an awesome four and a half hour presentation. I did on the stage and helped me with research and there's so much in that thing. If you think this was a lot, this is I just, know, we didn't even touch on we didn't even touch on the some real parts good. that were my favorite, but yeah, another time. But I think this was great to to just have this talk and bring this back mm -hmm. out and get history uh, history in the stars back out there. And from what I'm reading in the comments, people loved it and they just love hearing all oh, this. Good. So you know I was gonna ask for their questions, but you know, you guys have to you guys have a long trip tomorrow. So Yes we do. But we'll do this when we come back. We'll we'll be back next week, so all right. Well, thanks, Anne. Thank you, David. Appreciate it was you. Fun. If you all don't know, Anne's just been such a awesome part of High Vibe in so many ways. But to me, just the the, the greatest spiritual part about you is it's not just your history, but as the human that you are and how much you care about people. And you might be an amazing historian, but you're also an amazing human being. Well, thank you. So. And you are an amazing human being. Who creates wonderful, wonderful things. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate all of you, too, for being here. And we love you here at High Vibe. Make sure you check us out at highvibe.tv. And you can click on Purgatory to get that video. Or just be a member and get all the content that we do. Appreciate you all very much. Appreciate you, Anne. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye.